Uh, I had a hobby too. Mine happened to be guns and ballistics. And I studied guns and ballistics as much as I could and I wrote an article it was about high velocity. So out of all my years working at Weatherby, the last five have been some of the most exciting. Working with Adam, with him running the company. And to think that I get the opportunity of carrying on my grandfather's legacy 75 years later here in Sheridan, Wyoming. I mean, it really is a dream come true. On Our Mark, the Weatherby Podcast. All right, today on On Our Mark, the Weatherby Podcast, we've got some fun stuff to talk about. Uh, Roy's favorite cartridge, 257 Weatherby Mag. We've got a new face on the podcast, Mr. John Solberg. How are you today? Doing fabulous. What do you do here? I work in our sales department, a little bit of everything, but uh, primarily, you know, in order entry and helping our reps across the country, you know, get the word out about Weatherby and sell our, sell our products. So, yeah, work hand in hand with pretty much everybody from customer service all the way down to shipping the whole way through. So You, kept, kept, you helped keep us honest on the uh, live podcast we did a few weeks ago. So yeah. thanks for that. Thanks for chiming nice. in. You bet. I always love to participate in stuff like that. So pretty cool. Nice to have the information there and back you guys up when I can. How long have you been here? Six years as of yesterday was my six-year anniversary. Was it yesterday? I knew it was coming up because I passed mine a while ago. So you were... Yeah. I'll, I'll never forget your interview. You crushed it. You like that. You, you yeah. crushed it. Well, I got started because I sent Adam a DM on his Instagram. So that was pretty good. Slid into his DMs? Oh, you know, yeah. You bet. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And then in the interview, it was pretty funny. It was a Zoom chat. And so the background was like my dad's trophy wall. You know, it's got sheep and elk and all kinds of stuff. So I had to wow him right off the bat. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. yeah that, that helped. Seth, welcome back. Glad to be here. Tyler, hey. Hey. <laughs> I, came, I came prepared. I'm wearing a 257 t shirt today. So How do your legs feel? My legs are feeling much better. Yeah. Why, why were they feeling bad? Uh, they're feeling terrible because Luke and I decided to do the Bighorn trail run. So, yeah. And I did the 32. So now I can tell everyone I ran an ultra marathon. You did the 32. Or 32, uh, p- yeah. Pace-wise, you did it faster than I did the 18. Yeah. I was hurting the entire time, so <laughs> <laughs> don't let the time fool you. Did you did pretty good. That's yeah. pretty impressive. 32 miles. First ultra? First ultra. Kind of like ultra velocity 257s. Yeah. I did it super fast. <laughs> so. Nice segue. <laughs> yeah. You see what I did there? I, I did. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, give us some facts on 257. Yeah, so you kind of alluded to it's Roy was you know kind of acclaimed as Roy's favorite cartridge. Um, it was one of the first cartridges he developed too. So it didn't you know we launched Weatherby in 1945, and this was one of the Wildcat cartridges he was working on before he even started the company, right? So I think 1943, 1944 is when he was really putting you know a lot of data together, and then 1945 it was publicly released. How so. fun would that would have been back then to work on that like? You know what? I'm going to take a 375 H&H, and I'm going to neck that sucker down to 25 cal. Yeah, no doubt. Give it a curved shoulder. I'm going to do all sorts of fun stuff. Yeah, where did that come from? Yeah. But like cartridges back then, you know, like 3,000 feet per second was like an anomaly. So then you're talking about let's get it way up above that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, pretty impressive. Yeah, because some of the first, uh, I mean, some of the first like bullet weights, he was messed with like an 80 grain, right? And I was like... Went 3,800 feet per second, right? And it was like 800 feet per second faster than everything else on the market. So. Oh, no doubt. Well, and think about, like, the equipment that they had in terms of, like, optics. You know, I mean, you're shooting, like, a duplex reticle. And so it takes a 400-yard shot that used to be, you know, you wouldn't even think about doing something like that. And it makes yeah. it very easy to do. You know, the crosshairs never leave the hair. Well, so and your speak. powder selections back then were so limited, too. I mean, like, the 257 was optimized back in the olden days, I guess, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> to, for, like, 4350. Because that was, like, the slowest burning powder you could get back then. So, like, that was, like you know a huge limitation when you're trying to you know reach velocities like he was trying to get man yeah. you were talking about like equipment like i'm thinking man what did he use for his 
velocities. Like, what was he shooting through for a chronograph? He didn't have an Ehler system in his basement. Uh. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, on the, the Father's Day podcast, I was talking about that Garmin, the yeah. chronograph. Yes. Like, you've been using that a lot, John. Yeah, I have. Sweet. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, I've used it, you know, just for all the loading that I do at my own house. It's cool to see exactly how good your loads are because sometimes you think yeah, your standard your deviations, and, right, yeah. exactly, are, are good, but then you find out, like, oh, maybe they're not, you know. But, uh, yeah, no, it's been neat. I've been hand loading 257 you know and tried a couple different bullets i actually settled on the 92 grain hammer that we load here at the factory and i've got it going like 3756 i think is my average velocity which is insane so just shy of 3800 feet per second with a 92 grain bullet yeah so i almost want to pause i feel like i should know this already but like i want to i want to do some research on what a 1944 chronograph looked like yeah i have no idea what that would look like I feel like I should have done that ahead of this, but uh, mentioning it, but now I'm like stuck on it. You know, that's, that's pretty wild. I was not, uh, my, yeah, my parents weren't born yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My, my papa wasn't here, nor was my mama either. So yeah, yeah that, that's pretty wild. That's yeah, reaching to think back. about how they used to do that. I have no idea. I don't either because yeah. I also tried to Google it, and I, I'm looking at what looks like watches. So I'm not sure if you think Googling <laughs> oh, the right thing. The Timex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's we're talking like World War II type stuff where, you know, their navigation and things like that are like, where's the bend in the river down there when they're looking to bomb stuff over in, in Europe? Yeah, so, I mean, sure. it's just, yeah, that's wild to think like, huh, the technology definitely wasn't there yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to go back and do some research on that. And, you know, if you're listening, if you know the answer to what the chronograph situation was in 1944, on our mark at weatherby.com, email us. Yeah, we definitely just thought of a, another topic. Like, we could, like, go through all of the types of tools you would use in 1940 to do fun. any kind of testing. Yeah. That'd be... yeah, where's Jared when you, he would be <laughs> like, you know what? <laughs> Vacation. Who let that guy take vacation? We gave Seth, him a day off. Come on. Look what happens. Man. These are the facts that people need to know. Yeah. All right. What were the first, do you know what the first three, uh, like, bullet offerings were back oh, then? Oh, man. No, I Just don't. Just know that there were three? Or, oh, sorry. no, no. That was just like, I think on the cheat sheet, that was just the first oh, three yeah. of the three of the cartridges. Three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And it shares, you know, similar, ca- our same cases, 270 Weatherby, 7mm Weatherby. Mm-hmm. So. Those are kind of the first couple. Yeah, that's ones. the other thing too. Like bullets have come a long way. Mm-hmm. Like the the stuff we're using today, Sirocco's great bonded bullet, hammers, barns, like. Yeah, that's the kind of the topic of conversation with shooting a bullet that fast is bullet construction, right? Because yeah. like you can shoot like a, a you know lead core bullet, and you get it up around thirty eight hundred feet per second, and like. What it, it's going to expand very quickly, right? Hopefully. So to have a bonded bullet yeah. or even a monolithic <laughs> bullet that we have today, like it just takes that cartridge and, you know, back before where it's like, okay, it's perfectly suited for antelope and deer. And it's like, you can definitely kill an elk with it. But man, with these bonded bullets and the monolithic bullets, it turns it into a serious player, you know, within reason, you know, for large body game, even for elk. So, Yeah, there's, man, we've come a long way in uh, 80 plus years <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool technologically i mean i yes. mean whether we had nothing to do with the projectiles per se but no. you know yeah for sure but it's pretty pretty cool yeah it's also like it. pretty cool sorry john i didn't mean yeah. to interrupt you but um it's pretty cool that in 43 44 80 years ago this is still the fastest 257 cartridge so that they they had uh, they had tools available back then. I guess the powder breakthrough was going on. You know, they had good powder. But it's crazy that uh, we've got better projectiles now, but not necessarily the ability to get faster yet. Yeah, that is pretty wild. I mean, you start hitting that uh, the maximums of what you can really push out of these things, I guess. Yeah, just of the overall overall system. Yeah. but Just yeah. based on safety right yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah there's somebody out there saying off oh, four thousand uh, easy four yep mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's interesting with t57 being so popular for us that that's just not even a cartridge category that really took off because there's not a lot of other options that it's like 257 is like very much you know step above like product any other kind of production in that in that category no, very the, true it's the king i mean like 25 out six and 257 roberts 
new cartridges like the 25 Creedmoor have come out, you know, but nothing that's really like gone over the top and beat it, you know, in terms of velocity. So, yeah, yeah it's interesting that that's, a lot of our cartridges are that way, but um, we just haven't like met that technical technological threshold where people have pushed the velocity limit any further. It's like Roy did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he went and proved it. I mean, that's when John's talking about, you know, is it good to kill elk and things like that with a 257? And it's like, well, Roy knocked down a Cape Buffalo with one. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. and that was using like 1950s projectiles. So I've met multiple people at shows that have told me about things they've killed that with 257 that I'm like, ah, that's cool. I, I I don't, I would not, per- yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. disclaimer, it's Moose. not a good dangerous game cartridge. Nobody's yeah. going to say that, but Moose. I mean, I guess it's possible. A lot of bears. Yeah. A guy told me he killed a brown bear. I'd be like, that's scary. Oh, yeah. We've yeah. Got a, I want a big hole. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, we've got a good family friend uh, does a lot of hunting down in Colorado, and I was just down there for a shields training and had a conversation with him, and he was like, I've killed the last nine bulls with a 257. Bull out. Yeah. Hmm. And it's just, that's been his tried and true gun. And he knows the limitations yeah. of the cartridge. You know, he doesn't take a super far shot or anything like that. He you know, focuses on getting close and making a good shot. And like I say, it proves right there. You know, you've got nine bulls that are hanging out in the house that <laughs> 257 took down. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I was trying to think in my head, um, we do some like sales and marketing antelope trips. John, you and I were oh, on yeah. one together oh, yeah. last year. Yeah. That was what, nine hunters? Yeah, it was nine hunters. Yeah. Nine hunters shooting antelope, and we did it in two days. Yeah. Technically, we could have done it in one. But, so I've done yeah. that in other hunts like it uh, over the last six years, and I was trying to add up um, two fifty-seven like animals I've personally just seen, not necessarily pull the trigger on, sure. but seen killed with two fifty-seven. And I'm like well over fifty, but I don't know the exact number. And of of all of those. I'm trying to remember one that took a step. They almost are all just instant off. Yeah, it's like a lightning bolt hits them, and it's like, oh, that one's not getting up. It's wild. Yeah, it is. And some of them aren't, like, the best place shots, and they just turn Still off. Still seem to go down, yeah. I don't know. Like, people talk about, like, hydrostatic shock and all that kind of stuff, but I, I do think that something it's real. of that effect yeah. comes into play for sure. You know, that bullet, you know, when it reaches the animals going 3,400 feet per second on a fairly close shot, I mean, it's accelerating everything in that animal to that same velocity. And Mm so it just doesn't have much to do. The central nervous system just can't take it. So, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, like, say, Roy's story of of shooting high velocity. I mean, like, you know, he shoots a deer and it gets wounded because he's shooting a 30 out 6 at slower velocity. I mean, 257, the same concept comes into play here where it's just, it's creating a massive amount of damage. And so even on a marginal shot, like what you're saying, yeah, you know, it's still incapacitating that animal. So, yeah, none of them were long shots. They were all 300 and under. Yeah. Uh, but they were all just like. Yeah, 257 has changed my philosophy, like hunting for deer and antelope, you know, because like on my 257, I zero it at 300 yards and I've got a mil base scope. And so I know that 400 yards is a half mil and 500 yards is one mil. And so the cool part is, is like, it takes all the guesswork away. Yeah. Like I range an animal and if it's less than 500 yards, I just hold over. I don't have to dial or think about really anything. So it really simplifies the process. And so like for a novice shooter or somebody brand new, like my wife, uh, has I think even more than antelope. like yeah. novices is there's people in the industry that we're like getting ready to go on a hunt for and we'll often bring a rifle and I'll be like, we're going to do a 300 yard zero. And they're like, what? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> What's, why would you do that? And right. you have to explain it. And they're like, wait, what are you talking about? That's nuts. Yeah. You think kill zone on like an animal, you know, antelope size, 10 inches, right? Roughly. Yeah. Like you're going to be two and a half, maybe three inches high max. Yeah. Like you can put the product crossers on it. If you're shooting in that area, you're going to be just fine. And if you want to get real technical, like you can, but. Oh, the animal of a lifetime steps out and you got to make a quick call on how far <clears throat> it is. You don't really want to be taking your eyes off and fiddling around on dial and all that type of stuff. Like it does take so much of that guesswork out where, you know, out to four, roughly 400 yards shooting the 92 grains. If you're zeroed at 300 yards, you're dropping seven inches. Yeah. So, I mean, you're still right in the boiler on that thing. Yeah, so it, you like don't have to do anything crazy. Even the animal, and know. if it's at 360, even better. So, yeah. you know, that's. 
Yeah. yeah. What bullet are you on shooting on yours? Well, it's funny because like before we started loading the 92 grain hammer, I had insider information. And so I ordered a few from those guys and started loading them and, uh, you know, got some advice, but that 92 grain hammer has been my favorite. I've shot it, you know, everything I've killed everything from coyotes on, you know, all the way up to antelope and deer with it. Um, and I would have no reservations to shoot an elk within, you know, probably that three to 400 yard mark, you know, obviously ideal conditions and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. You got to be confident. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, that 92 grain monolithic's good. That Sirocco is also really bad medicine. I mean, that's when you get something going that fast. If you're yeah. if you're not monolithic, then a good bonded bullet like that can really hit something hard and not come apart bad. So no doubt, yeah. nice option. You know, I've had luck. You know, uh, my wife she's killed a couple of antelope with her 257, and we just shot interlocks. You know, so if there's nothing to like bad mouth uh, you know a lead core bullet it'll still do it obviously it's not an ideal premium choice of a bullet but it can still get it done so for the guys that are out there thinking like well do i have to go out and buy a premium bullet like no it's recommended but you know the interlock can still get it done so yeah your uh your wife has shot a couple of antelope mm-hmm. with it you're saying the kind of the cool 257s in that kind of sweet spot too with like super low, low recoil and like being able to manage and shoot it's comfortable tame, i yeah. think yeah i mean yeah. Well, I think we get used to, yeah, you know, bigger it. ones. But even on the overall market, like 287, it's like 6.5 Creedmoor, maybe less than. Yeah. Recoil-wise. Yeah, with any kind of, you know, muzzle device, whether it be a brake yeah. or, or suppressor, ideally. Yeah. It, it, it's really manageable. It's one that, like, when we go to these, you know, different events around the country and we're letting people demo rifles, you know, if somebody maybe is worried about recoil, it's just a nice cartridge to put them behind. Talk about whether it be cartridges, velocity, and then obviously not rock their world, which is which is good. So Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of people chasing speed, wanting to try out, you know, some of the really fast Weatherby stuff. I mean, you've got three that are right there at the 3,700-ish feet per second when you're talking 240, 257, and the 65, 300. Mm-hmm. And you kind of have three flavors of recoil with those, you know, obviously at six, five, 300, it's a little more barky, but the 257 and 240 are both pretty darn tame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. 92 grain hammers going 3,700 at the muzzle. That's just, that's just moving. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like it is. big energy numbers too. 20, basically 2,800 foot pounds of kinetic energy at, at the muzzle and still a thousand foot pounds at 500 yards. So. It does, like, slow down. Obviously, the 25 cals don't have the best BC generally, but uh, you're you're retaining more than enough at 400 yards to feel Oh, yeah, feel for real big game animals, it. for sure. And then, you know, like the yeah. guys who are doing long-range varmint hunting, you know, any kind of coyote calling or anything like that, like 257 turns you into a long-range player. So Yeah, that's a great mm-hmm. coyote round yes i i and it's fun it's just fun to talk about stories but like i was antelope hunting last year and ended up shooting a coyote at you know about 495 yards and like it was nuts we were driving on top of a ridge came over the top saw a coyote and you know how it is they see you and they're gone they, and they so just start by the time that i get my bipod set up and laid down and prone we range him in 495 but you know the nice part is it's like i know exactly where to hold it's a mill you know so put <laughs> yeah. it on and, and there he died and you know, the shooting suppressed, you know, obviously changes. There was an antelope about 200 yards away. It would have been cool to shoot a coyote and then an antelope. That just didn't work out. He wasn't the You should have size, just lied but. on your story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just but, kidding. Yeah. So, no, I mean, that cartridge has changed, like, say, my whole philosophy for hunting just because of how flat it shoots. And, like, you know, even, like, in the antelope hunting, when you sneak up and you get real close to an antelope, you're using the hill just kind of as concealment. Oh, yeah. And then it's, yeah. like, you almost get too close sometimes, right? You like, can you get like, ooh, 75 yards, and then it's like you play this game of like, well, is he coming at me or is I going at him, right? Well, anymore, I just say, I'm going to go at him. And I go to the top of the hill, he can see me, and you know how it goes. They see you, they're going to run away, and eventually they're going to stop and turn and look at you. And generally, they're not going to run much further than a couple hundred yards. And so oh, yeah. when you've got a flash shooting you cartridge, mm-hmm. you can be very calm in that situation and, you know, make, you know, be, be determine how that, how that all plays out yeah. is really what it is when you have yeah. confidence in a, in a cartridge like that. Yeah, mule deer and antelope, man, they give you that. Yeah, they give you that look. Whitetail, not not as much. They sure. just like to bug. They're it. gone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty. Did awesome. You see the waving tail forever. Yeah, it just goes back and forth. It literally is. This yeah. is like, especially the does when they get that like trot off. You know, yeah. kind of working their back legs. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, definitely a cartridge for Western big game, but like even back East, I think there's applications, you know, you talk about guys that are shooting across fields, you know, where they do have the opportunity to take those longer shots. This cartridge still is, is a huge help to those kinds of folks too. So 
Again, yeah. just takes that guesswork out. You know, if it's a if you're not sure if it's an 80 yard shot or a 140 yard shot, it doesn't matter to the 257. Like that is just one of those that you put that where you want it to go and within you know a reasonable range, it's just going to get there. Yeah. yeah, and it gets there really fast. So my my family's back in Missouri. My brother in law has a 257, and so my sister has killed three or four bucks with a Vanguard 257. Mm-hmm. So it's great in the Midwest. Yeah. Dude, yeah, I think for a lot of places, um, we are we do a lot of business in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have spent much time in Pennsylvania, but those woods are thick. And I, I don't know this for certain, but I my, my guess is one of the reasons that we're pretty popular there is, other than having a great rep. Uh, <laughs> shout out. Yeah, <laughs> shout, out to, shout out to Randy. But, um, you know, if it wasn't working, it would only go so far. But um, I, th- I think that the deer steps out in a really narrow lane. I think we've all had hunting situations where you're hunting somewhere where man, if if this thing gets into the woods, yeah, you got to calling in the dogs, you know, and that off switch is pretty, pretty powerful. So yeah, pretty cool. Definitely got to like that for sure. What else did we need to talk about on this Tyler? I mean, that's the kind of the, 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 the main things we didn't, I didn't have a bunch of just, we get asked a lot all the time to talk about 257. Yeah. So it's always fun to revisit it. And, and I mean, in like the this. popularity of our cartridges, you know, 257, 300, weather B, 65, 300 are the three most popular and, you know, like it's, traveling around the country. It's our, it's our second yeah. most. There you the go. 257 exactly. is the second. Yeah. yeah. 300 like, weather first. At the shows that we go to, I mean, how many people have come up and told you stories of the 257 uh, weather B? Yeah. 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 Well, like Luke, that was like Luke talking about seeing, you know, 50 of these animals. It's like I've been able to visualize probably uh, roughly a thousand from various stories that it's yeah, like, yeah, right. Uh-huh. Yeah, that yeah, sounds right. like a carbon copy of the last one, and it's the carbon copy of the one before it because it just works that way. I mean, it's it's such an effective hunting round. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I really am. I can't recall one that took a step. I know that sounds funny, but I think maybe – one uh, on an antelope hunt because it it was just a terrible shot I had a nervous hunter and just didn't make the best shot and still like heard it real bad to the point where it got the second shot in pretty quick and it didn't go far but yeah they yeah it's effective yeah well and you know, I was listening to your guys's 240 talk the other day, and we were talking about moving targets, right? And mm-hmm. so a lot of times, you know, even for like a coyote hunter, you know, a moving target, you were talking yeah. about a 240 time and flight is next to nothing. Yep. And so for those coyote hunters out there that are looking for, you know, 22 to 50, but better because of a heavier bullet, um, you know, those running shots really become point and shoot too. They're, they're a lot simplified. Well, especially if you're out here, you know, again, that you can shoot stuff, you know, bigger game with 22 cal with restrictions on it right but if you get up to the six millimeter or up to the the 25 cal i mean you can take that gun out you can be looking for coyotes and if it's deer season and the right deer steps out then you're ready to go with that too i mean you're not limiting yourself down to oh i'm just going to take out my varmint gun today and uh, and go shoot coyotes i mean you can it's a it's a multi-purpose you know rifle at that point yeah, so yeah yeah like say like you know and it's like everybody here owns more than one rifle but like you know when you're categorizing like the type of game that you're hunting you know light and medium game 257 fits the bill and then on the heavier you can you can go to 300 weatherby or something like that but 257 is one that if you're mainly going to be hunting light bodied game you know 257 yeah. makes a big you know it makes a strong point for itself so yeah. you know have you ever shot moving targets with a rifle? Not other than coyotes, like not like practicing wise, I guess. Now, have you said? No, I mean, don't like throw yourself under <coughs> the bus here, but yes, like it's 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 different than I expected. Like I've shot a ton of shotguns, and uh, it was years ago, but I was in Germany for a mm-hmm. hunt, and you have to go through like an accelerated version of their hunt school, and part of it is a shooting test at the end, and the last step was uh this 50 yard shot with a rifle on a boar that like just runs across on the ground and it was kind of hard to like figure out what kind of lead you would need and they're like you can't put it right on i'm like dude it's 50 yards i think i was shooting 300 wind mag (laughs) (laughs) and i'm like i'm just put it right on there and it wasn't it was like hitting the butt like this is this is kind of weird. It's different. I, 
Oh, no, it's way different. That's yeah. if something's on the move, and depending on what it is, how far away it is, and how fast it's moving, the the leads do get way farther than what you would think they would be. Yeah, it was it was interesting. So, I could see how a lot of people get in trouble trying to shoot coyotes. One thing, yeah. but trying to shoot deer, you know, and other animals on on the run because that time it takes from your brain to decide to shoot to well it till it gets to your fingertip and pulling the trigger. It's, it's not instant. No, it's, it's a not. lot of instinctual shooting. I mean, really, truthfully, yeah. it's, you know, people say shooting a shotgun, you know, you're not aiming. I mean, on a running shot, like, yes, you can get down and get very mathematical, but, you know, right. like shooting coyotes or shooting targets, moving targets, stuff like that, a lot of it's pretty instinctual. Yeah, it's pretty wild. But yeah. I was I was shocked at how different it was. And then I've shot some matches since then where there's, like, a moving target. Yeah, that's across. that's what I was picturing in my head was one of those. <laughs> and those are challenging too yeah. but it's it's fun it's not something most people practice every day but 257 will make you better at it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> it ain't gonna hurt you no yeah. no uh where can they find out more information on 257 uh com. yeah get on yeah. our website if you don't follow us uh on email that's really like the number one way i brought this up a few times but we just we get throttled on social media. So if you want to get the latest and greatest from us, we don't fill up your email inbox. What do we do like three emails a month, maybe four. Yeah, just a few. Yeah, like yeah. one a week. We rarely go past that, but um, that's the most reliable way you can get information updates from us. So go to our website and and subscribe to our newsletter. It'd be great. So there's no guarantee you're going to see our social media post. Yeah, and if you're uh, looking for ammo. Pretty much it. Check any Weatherby dealer. We've got a lot of it in stock. Oh, yeah. so. We've got all flavors in stock currently. And yeah. like I said, there's there's lots of ammo out there. Um, and if your dealer doesn't have it, you can tell them to order it and we'll get it to them. That's for sure. Yeah, we have almost all SKUs. We even still have stock. a Nosler SKU left, you know, the uh, 115 ballistic tip. Yeah, the BSTs are yeah, still, still there. Got some yeah, of those I checked before. We're, we're in stock on all, all of our options. Yeah, on I was trying 57. to think of one we were out of. So, no, yeah. we're in great shape there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, if you can't find it somewhere, Ammo Seek's a really good tool. Um, it's less. I wonder. If, I wonder what their business has done since uh, post COVID. The market slowed down quite a bit. I mean, people. We we're directing people to them nonstop to, when they're trying to find a local dealer or somebody to buy a certain SKU. Than when we were even out of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, hopefully that they're they're still crushing it. But it's a crazy market out there. It's definitely slowed down. But hunting season is like right around the corner it's a great time to buy some ammo for hunting season before everybody else runs out and gets it so draw results came out yesterday john you got a draw results story i did yeah you I got, got nothing i drew nothing yesterday <laughs> but the one earlier in the year i'll take yeah i got that bison tag for here in wyoming so very excited resident about that. bison tag yeah that's awesome i'm that's... not going to advocate to shoot a bison with the 257 weatherby but 300 weatherby is probably what i'm going to take yeah yeah yeah. That's the same uh, tag Dana drew, right? Yeah, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yep, exact same tag. So every year is different. It's also weather dependent. And, you know, I think it's just time spent in the field. So You were with your dad on a buffalo hunt? Yeah. Yeah, he drew the Henry Mountain Bison tag. Um, that's cool. Gosh, it was probably eight years ago. And that's another once-in-a-lifetime bison tag. You know, you've got over 2 million acres of BLM land to hunt. And yeah. It turned into a 10-day hunt for us. I think the day that we killed the bull he you know, eventually killed, we walked 13 miles. Shot him That's right cool. at dark, had to yeah. like, yeah, just skin and up. quarter him in the dark. Just was... quarter him and throw him in your pack and walk out? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a harder, harder hunt than that. It was, it was pretty I can't insane. can't imagine. Yeah, a couple hours from camp and yeah, shot him right at dark, had to, you know, skin and quarter him and one of those things where you go back to camp, get like an hour of sleep and then drive back the next day and pack him out. It was, it was pretty intense. That'd yeah. Pro brutal. tip, just uh, sign up early to get a hind quarter. If you're taking out bison, that's the, uh, that's the easier ones on bison. Yeah. The hind, yeah. Yeah, they're smaller. Yeah. Hmm. It makes sense. Yeah. I just remember when we leaned him up for pictures, like their vertebrae, their spine is so tall, yeah. you know, it's not, they don't have the same shape it's at all. A, it's as, taking a beef out. I mean, they're huge. Oh yeah. They're bigger than a cow, right? Yes. Like body size. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be pretty so, insane. But I'm pretty ooh. excited. Like I said, we've got lots of information on this thing with Adam that drew it and then, you know, the local guy, Sam Davis. Sam, yeah, they yeah. did it two totally different ways. I think Sam was like an August hunt and Dana's was in January. January. Yeah, 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 yeah like exactly. Cold. Cold, cold, cold. Like minus 15 cold. Yeah. Well, that's pretty awesome. Yep. Good luck. Yeah. Very excited. Good luck. Thank you. I drew some antelope, pretty good unit in Wyoming. Nice. I think my 
uh, warm up the 257 for that. Perfect. Yeah. I expect nothing less, actually. It's so funny. <laughs> we get new employees to come in all the time, and they're like, what should I buy? You know, and being on the sales team, you know, I'm the guy that they ask, right? And I try to talk everybody into owning at least a 257 to start out. So That was That's my funny. first company yeah. purchase was a 257. So you're, you're wrong if you don't. Mission yeah. accomplished. Yeah. 257 Deluxe right here. I don't think it gets any more weatherby than that. Yeah. That's True. pretty awesome. I hate scratching it, but I also <laughs> like taking it out. So. <laughs> yeah. oh, one one more with. 257 story. When we did antelope hunt two years ago, JD in product development, he had like the most Wyoming gun. I feel of all time. It was, it was he had the, Wyoming the he had, yeah, he had the se- elevation 72 20, which is like the backcountry version of the cow poke. And it was in 257. And that's what he shot his antelope with. I was like, yeah, welcome another to Wyoming. One, <laughs> another one that didn't take a step. I've got that one in like 4k 120 yeah. super slow-mo just <laughs> boop, off. <laughs> yeah, he asked me what he should take out. I'm like, Oh, this would be a great gun to take out. <laughs> Yeah, it was yeah. so. I was like, I had only lived in Wyoming for a couple couple of months at that point, and it was like literally the the cow pokes everywhere at every gas station. I'm like, hey, there's your gun, JD. He's like, yeah, yeah, so. it's pretty fun. All right, thanks for listening.